from Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. This is the Coral Ridge Hour. It has been said that the sanctity of life is like the big E on the eye chart. Those who can't see that life is sacred can't clearly see or understand any other moral issue facing mankind. The sanctity of life is not just some odd little view off on the side that we can ignore. It is the foundation of Western civilization. In the powerful booklet, Life and Inalienable Right, co-authors Dr. D. James Kennedy and Dr. Jerry Newcomb look at some of the most compelling issues surrounding the sanctity of human life. For your generous donation toward the work of this ministry, we'll send you the booklet, Life and Inalienable Right, to help you clearly articulate and defend the sanctity of human life as the foundation for not only a Christian worldview, but for civilization itself. I am delighted and honored to be able to be with you this evening at this institution which has such a long and proud history, soon to be celebrating your 300th anniversary, I discover, in just a few more years. How wonderful that is. And of course, I felt uh, quite at home when I was informed that this organization was founded by 10 clergymen who uh, were noted as learned members of the community desiring a school, an institution for teaching. 
uh, arts and sciences and propagating the Christian religion. And that, I think, is a wonderful thing. I was also delighted to see that your motto is looks at veritas, light and truth. And uh, that is basically what I will be addressing you about tonight. My subject, as stated, is absolutes in a relativistic age. Dr. Alan Bloom, professor of social thought at the University of Chicago and former professor at Yale University, a school located around here somewhere, I'm told, is the author of a very big book of the past five years, The Closing of the American Mind. And interestingly, in that book, he says, in the very first sentence of the first paragraph of the first chapter, he says this, there is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relative. There are no absolutes. Now, Mark Twain said, the problem with most people is not what they don't know, but what they know for certain that isn't true. <laughs> and I think that statement applies to this discussion this evening very much. Virtually all of our students in high school have learn that uh, there are no absolutes. You probably heard about the teacher who said to his class, you can know nothing for certain. And one student said, but teacher, are you sure? He said, I'm certain. <laughs> and if you were to ask a high school graduate how it is, that there are no absolutes, how it is that everything is relative and all truth is relative, he will either look at you blankly and not have the faintest idea why that is so, other than that he has been told it is so, or he may, if he is uh, somewhat uh, more erudite, tell you, haven't you ever heard of Einstein? Where have you been for the past 50 years? Haven't you ever read the theory of relativity? Don't you know that we live in a relativistic universe and that everything is relative? And that settles the matter. Einstein said it, and it must be so. No, he didn't. This is what he said. Relativity applies to the realm of physics, not ethics. Mm. So, how is it that Einstein's theory has been transported into every other discipline and we have ended up in America today with almost a total moral relativism which somehow has been deduced from Einstein's theory of relativity which has absolutely nothing whatever to do with ethics or with morals. Now, sometimes students don't realize that when a teacher or a professor says there are no absolutes, you need to understand what he is saying. He is also saying there is no God. Because, because you see, God is the ultimate absolute. He is absolutely supreme. 
He is absolutely infinite in his power and his wisdom and his knowledge and everything, all of his attributes. God is the ultimate absolute, and what he says is the ultimate and absolute truth. And uh, therefore, keep in mind that when anyone says there are no absolutes, they are simply giving you a veiled and cloaked atheism. And maybe they don't wish to come out and state it, but that is exactly what they are doing under the cover of no absolutes. Now, we, I think, realize, I trust we all do, that science and religion operate in very, from very opposite points of origin. Science began with practically no knowledge and has been growing over the centuries to the place where we are now. This same thing is true of philosophy. Man's philosophy, which officially began with Thales and was an attempt by reason to understand without revelation from God the meaning and significance of all life. And from Thales to Kant, there was this grand endeavor uh, to try to understand the meaning of life and the meaning of the world that we live in. And unfortunately, it ended in failure. And uh, since that time today, all of our philosophies have degenerated into irrationalism, as man has discovered that apart from revelation, he cannot find the meaning or significance of life. So both science and philosophy began with very little and have grown to this point, uh, however successfully. However, religion, at least the Christian religion, and I speak, of course, as a Christian minister, begins with the revelation of God given to us in his word, and that began with perfection. It's not, re Christianity is not man's effort to try to find God. It is God's revelation of himself to man. So one begins at zero and tries to work its way up. The other one begins at 100 percent. And uh, unfortunately, too often we distort that through the years. But they operate on a very, very different kind of principle. Not only is it true that when a person says there are no absolutes, are they saying that there is no God? They're also saying that there is no Word of God, that the Scriptures are not the Word of God. Now, the Bible says over and over again, Jesus said of the Word, Thy Word is truth, and that uh, heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle of the law shall in no wise pass away till all be fulfilled. The Bible says that it is truth. It is truth revealed from God. Therefore, it is absolutely true. When God's word says something, that is the word of God and that is true. Now that is not based merely on some predilection on my part or those that believe, but it is based upon evidence. God gives evidence whereby we may know that the scriptures are indeed the word of God, evidence which has con convinced uh, hundreds of millions of people over the years. Now. When people say that there are no absolutes, they are also saying that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. Because as God the Son, He Himself is absolute. He is without sin, without imperfection. He was the altogether perfect one. So keep in mind that whenever a person says there are no absolutes, they are saying there is no God, the Bible is not the Word of God, and Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. And I think that we need to see that that is quite a lot of transporting the truths from physics into the realm of religion 
and morality. Now, with relativistic morals, there also comes subjectivism. And uh, there is no objective standard outside. And now today, we no longer talk about morals. We talk about values, a term that Nietzsche gave to us. And uh, values are simply anything that anyone chooses to place a value upon. And somehow, we have come to the place of believing that every person has some authority to, to decide whatever is good or bad for him, whatever is right or wrong, whatever is of value and what is not of value. And of course, a corollary of that is that he cannot impose that upon anyone else. You can't impose your values on someone else. That's absolutely true, as long as you're talking about merely values which we have simply accepted. God's law, however, applies to all created beings because he is the creator and he will apply it to all of them uh, without exception. Another corollary of that is that since our values and mores do not come from God, they must come from some source that influences us, and that is cultural. So these values, these morals are relativistic, they are individual, they are subjective, and they are culturally induced. Now, however, we find that we can't live with that kind of a view of life. One of the most interesting examples of how we can't live with that took place at the Nuremberg trials after World War II. You may recall that the Nazi leaders were brought up before that court and they were charged with all manner of crimes and uh, slaughtering uh, millions and millions of Jews and other people. What was their defense? They were very clever. They said, we have done nothing wrong. The Supreme Court of Germany declared that Jews were non-people, non-persons, that we were told the laws would pass that they could be killed. We did nothing illegal, we did nothing immoral, and who are you to come over here and impose your morals on us? The very thing that had been taught in every university in the world for the previous 50 years, absolutely through the allied def uh, attorneys for a 50-yard loss. They didn't know what to say. If everything is absolute, if there are no absolutes, rather, if everything is relativistic, if everything is culturally induced, if we cannot impose our culture upon another culture, then how dare we say that the Nazis were wrong for killing millions of people? Well, they were so taken back that after huddling for some time, they finally decided that they would retreat, since they apparently were not willing to retreat to the uh, moral law of God. They retreated to natural law, which uh, had been held down through many, many centuries, less precise, more vague, but nevertheless still having some moral content to it, and they appealed to natural law, and it was on that basis that the Nazis were convicted. That same natural law that Clarence Thomas was so viciously criticized for holding to. You remember that? Yes, it becomes very difficult to live in a completely relativistic world. One person says, we don't live our lives relativistically. If you're waiting in your car at a train crossing and there's a train, huge train coming at 60 miles an hour, you know that if you get your car out in front of that train, you know that you're not going to be relatively dead. you're going to be absolutely dead. <laughs> we can't live by that. And numerous social critics and philosophers and social scientists are saying 
that it is this view of moral relativism that is absolutely causing the morality of this nation to crumble before our eyes. But over against the moral relativism of our time, I think we need desperately to reassert the fact of what Jesus Christ said. He said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now we are told that we can't know truth, that we can't know anything for certain. Now granted that science only gives high probabilities, but through revelation, the religion, we can know the truth. The scriptures say these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. I'm happy to say that I know that I have eternal life. I know that should I die today, I will be with Christ forever. I have not always known that. But when I was a young man, about two years after college, I heard the gospel and I came to know that. I was sitting on a plane some months ago when they declared that they didn't know that the wheels were down and they were going to have a crash landing and people started wailing and crying and weeping. It was a very interesting thing. And I, it was a Christian lady I knew right across from me and I was talking to her. I was trying to talk to her loud enough so that other people could be encouraged. And the man behind, next to me, he couldn't understand it. How can you talk like that? I said, well, if the plane goes down, I go up. <laughs> But I would like to ask you, my friend, do you know that? Do you know for certain that you have eternal life? The Scripture says that these things are written that we may know that. Now, sad to say that uh, many people who have rejected the uh, scriptural truth have not done it for the reasons that sometimes people think that they have. For example, Nietzsche rejected uh, the scriptures, he rejected Christianity, he hated religion, and he hated Christianity in particular. And he is, of course, the one who said, God is dead. But, you know, the amazing thing is that millions of people believed him. He never proved it, he just asseverated it. It's one thing to declare something, it's another thing to prove it. Somebody wrote upon a building in graffiti, it said, God is dead, Nietzsche. Someone else came along and wrote, Nietzsche is dead, God. <laughs> it's better to debate an issue before settling it, said one philosopher, than settling an issue before debating it. And that's exactly what Nietzsche did. But let me tell you, no one has ever proved that God is dead or that God doesn't exist. In fact, atheism, if you don't know it, is irrational. I wonder how many people are aware of that. To say that there is no God is to assert what in logic is called a universal negative. Now it is well known that no human being can prove any universal negative. You cannot prove that nowhere in the universe are there little green men. You can't prove that. You can't prove that nowhere in the universe is there a being such as God. In order to prove that, you would have to know what is in every part of the entire universe, which is to say, in order to prove that there is no God, you would have to be God. And then you would have proved yourself wrong. <laughs> and we need also to remember that there is a moral element in the hearts of men that caused them to reject God. For example, 
Bertrand Russell, a brilliant philosopher of the 20th century, strongly anti-Christian. He wrote a book, Why I Am Not a Christian. Someone else wrote a book, Why I Am Not an Atheist. But he said, science can't dictate to philosophy. They can't tell me that life has no meaning. He said, however, I choose to believe that life has no meaning. I choose to believe that life has no meaning. Why? Because philosophy has proved this? No. Because that frees me up, he said, to my erotic and political choices. He was a radical socialist and a radical immoralist as well. Uh, multiple marriages and divorces, and the president of one of the divorce courts when granting the divorce to his wife said that he was not only a roué who had committed multiple adulteries, but he committed adulteries of the type that no decent adulterer would even commit. He seduced everybody that came across his path. When he was invited to stay at the home of a friend of his who was a physician for two nights, on the second night he spent the night seducing the man's teenage daughter. No wonder he didn't want to be a Christian. It would definitely have interfered with his sexual mores. No, there is a nature about man that is fallen and a nature which causes people not to want to believe that there is a creator because they do not believe, want to believe that this creator is a lawgiver and that this lawgiver is going to be their judge and hold them responsible for what they have done in their lives. They don't want to believe that. God has placed immortality within the heart of men and we can't get around it. There are those who have denied it. But what do they have? What is their lives? What are their lives like? The most militant atheist and skeptic of the first quarter of this century was Robert Ingersoll, a brilliant and very eloquent man. He spent his life going around lecturing against God, Christianity, and the Bible. And then his brother died. What do you do if you're an atheist and a relative dies? You can hardly call clergymen. So he said that he would preach the funeral. And so at the graveside, he preached the funeral oration. And this is what he said. Whether in mid-sea or amidst the breakers on the farther shore, a wreck must mark at last the end of each and all. And every life, no matter whether every hour was filled with joy and every moment jeweled with love, must at its end become a tragedy as deep and as dark as can be woven out of the warp and woof of mystery and death. Life is a narrow veil between, between twin peaks of eternity. We strive in vain to look beyond the heights. We cry aloud. And the only answer is the echo of our wailing cry. The most eloquent, original, imaginative, persuasive advocate of atheism that ever lived was no doubt Nietzsche. He fashioned the 20th century. To him can be attributed the life movements of Hitler, Mussolini, Lenin, 
Stalin. God is dead and the blood will flow in the next century, he said prophetically. But he spent the last 11 years of his life as a raving madman, totally insane. Life cannot be lived without meaning and hope. As a young man, I heard the gospel for the first time in my life. I lived to be 24 without ever knowing it. But I heard of this incredible love of one that loved me so much as to be willing to come down from glory and go to a shameful cross, to hang naked upon that agonizing tree and there to have imputed by his father my guilt upon him and to take in my place the penalty for sin that I condignly deserve to take myself. That he endured, we cannot know, we cannot understand the pains that he had to bear, but I believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. I came to see a love that I had never known before, a person who loved me not because of anything that I was, but in spite of everything that I was, a person who loved me purely and only because of what he was, a God of all grace and a God of love, a God that was willing unconditionally to forgive me of all of my sins and to accept me into his family, to make of me a new person, to create a new heart within me, to clothe me in the robes of his own righteousness and to make me his son and heir eternal, and to assure me a place in paradise which he paid for on the cross and ascended to prepare in heaven. And I know this day, this night, that I will be with him. And I have known that for a number of decades now, and it gets more glorious and more wonderful with every passing year. My life has meaning. I know that I am a child of the king. I am of a royal family. My father is the king of kings and lord of lords. I know that I have been cleansed and given a great and glorious passion for this world and a purpose for this world, that I should indeed proclaim the glorious glad tidings that God loves sinners and is willing to accept them as they are. If they will repent of their sins and place their trust in the divine Son of God who so loved them and so suffered in their place. And dear friend, I saw that love that night as I was seated alone in my apartment after having lived a very profligate life where God and Christ had no place in my life. And I want you to know that My heart melted before that love and I slipped out of that easy chair onto my knees for the first time in my adult life. And I said, oh God, I didn't know. I didn't know. Forgive me. Forgive me. I didn't see any angels. I heard no angelic choirs, but I stood up from that prayer, a different man. The next morning, while I was shaving, I remember the thought came into my mind, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, declares that I am going to live with him in paradise forever. And a chill went right down my spine. And that, my dear friends, is the greatest absolute I have ever learned. And if you have not experienced it, if you have not claimed it, God invites you to come to him and receive the free gift of everlasting life. May we pray. 
O God, thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. And there are some here tonight, Lord, whose hearts are just that way. They have sought fulfillment, as Augustine did, in learning, in education, in knowledge, but that God-shaped blank within their hearts has not been filled. Lord, I pray that right now you will enable them, as so many have done before, to say, O oh Christ, I surrender my life to you. I know I'm a sinner. Underneath all of the pretensions, I know that I have done many things that I am ashamed of. How must you, the all-holy God, look upon them? And yet, amazing to say, you are willing to wash me whiter than snow, to forgive me, to cleanse me, and to accept me as your child now and evermore. And when the stars have burnt into cinders and this universe has collapsed, I will still be with you and will only have just begun to live with you forever. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God, I pray. Amen. Hello, I'm Rob Pacienza, Senior Pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, founded by Dr. D. James Kennedy. If you just prayed that prayer of repentance with Dr. Kennedy, asking Jesus Christ to come into your life and change you and forgive you, then you are embarking on a whole new course with Jesus at the helm. To help you in that journey, we want to send you Beginning Again, which is precisely what you're doing. In these pages, you'll find the Gospel of John, a great place to start your Bible reading, and you'll even find answers to some commonly asked questions. It's yours when you write to our address or call our toll-free number. Just ask for a beginning again, and may God richly bless you. It has been said that the sanctity of life is like the big E on the eye chart. Those who can't see that life is sacred can't clearly see or understand any other moral issue facing mankind. The sanctity of life is not just some odd little view off on the side that we can ignore. It is the foundation of Western civilization. In the powerful booklet, Life and Inalienable Right, co-authors Dr. D. James Kennedy and Dr. Jerry Newcomb look at some of the most compelling issues surrounding the sanctity of human life. For your generous donation toward the work of this ministry, we'll send you the booklet Life, An Inalienable Right, to help you clearly articulate and defend the sanctity of human life as the foundation for not only a Christian worldview, but for civilization itself. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries. 